can learn a lot about a martial arts class by the way in which it begins and ends. They all have their own small rituals and verbal incantations. Consider the closing of a fairly typical class at the Central Lightsaber Academy. Sweating in a not sufficiently air conditioned space, the 14 of us gathered, deactivated our weapons, and received a few parting words of advice from our leader, Darth Nihilus. He says, your basic combat applications are looking great. Remember, next week we're going to be going over choreography again. Anyone who wants to uh, spar should use that set of mats back there at the back of the room. And remember, remember, this is all just for fun. This is, give or take a few small details, how every single class ends. Unrelentingly upbeat and supportive, it is not the parting benediction that one would expect to receive from a self-styled Dark Lord of the, Stiths, of the Sith. Students standing around me break up and disperse into small groups. Four of them grab fencing masks and heavy armored gloves to get some sparring in before they head home. You can see other ones exchanging contact information to get together to practice their choreography during the week. And in the middle of this all, one martial arts studies researcher stands asking, why does someone as manifestly intense as Darth Nihilus, you know, note the name, insist repeatedly, multiple times a class, that this is all just for fun? Now certainly, the students at the CLA are having a lot of fun. You can see it in the expressions on their faces, in the intensity with which they engage the curriculum. The atmosphere of the classes is inevitably focused, yet relaxed. There's not a lot of talking as uh, you can't let your concentration slip, right? You know, blade work always requires a high degree of concentration or you will get smacked upside the head with a glowing blue, green, or red blade, right? So you must concentrate even if the weapons in question do not actually exist. Now, for an activity that is just for fun, the students at the CLA show a surprising degree of dedication. Half of them, when interviewed, say that they practice daily, some for up to an hour. Everyone in the room has purchased their own stunt sabers, that's an example of one, even though the school always has plenty of free loaners. Most of these are inexpensive models costing less than $100, but some people have spent up to five or $600 for a replica weapon that's personally meaningful to them. When asked for the reasons uh, that they started to come, they provide a variety of, re of responses. Perhaps the most common is that they were looking for a fun way to stay in shape and get active. For the self-described martial artists in the room, maybe about a third of the people there, the lightsaber is an irresistible thought experiment and a release from the stresses, the constraints, and the politics of the more traditional Asian martial arts. For about half of the students in the class, uh, a lightsaber you know, activity like this is also an extension of their Star Wars fandom. As one of my classmates, a self-styled Jedi noted, the CLA is where badass nerds are made. <laughs> Yet, after a few weeks, what almost everyone focuses on in the interviews is the community. When I first heard about the lightsaber class, I thought it was so dorky I was totally in. I thought we were just going to be goofing off and hitting each other in the head with lightsabers. I totally did not expect what this has come to be, a new group of friends unlike anything that I have encountered before. In her comments, Darth Zana then goes on to describe the degree of personal empowerment and confidence that she has felt as she has become a more competent duelist over the last couple months. She even uh, recently uh, joined an uh, kind of an, an open style sword tournament and, and acquitted herself quite well against swordsmen from a variety of styles. Darth, Sa Darth Zana's sentiments seem to be widely shared and, and probably account for the CLA's really remarkable student retention rate. I don't think I have seen a student leave the entire time I've been doing my field work <laughs> there. Between the fast-paced classes and the variety of activities, the general social dynamic in the room, there can be no doubt that the students are having a lot of fun. And yet I found Nihilus's refrain puzzling. While I have always enjoyed my martial arts training, I suspect that just for fun is not a turn of phrase that most practitioners in the traditional martial arts would be willing to embrace. What we do in the quote unquote 
real martial arts is always spoken of somewhat differently. We use a rhetorical framework that at once justifies and then apologizes for the resources that we spend on our training. Taekwondo, after all, builds character in young American children. Kendo teaches children in Japan what it means to be Japanese. Styles as diverse as MMA and Wing Chun claim to teach vital, real-world self-defense skills, even though we all know very few of those students are ever going to be attacked. While many individuals enjoy training in the martial arts, I think few of us would, in, would admit that we are in a hobby that is really just for fun. We almost always shift our discussion into the realm of investment and hard work. In this regard, Darth Nihilus is no exception. We're not moonlighting as a dark lord of the Sith. He's a professional martial arts instructor. The Central Lightsaber Academy is actually housed within a cavernous 2,500 square foot commercial space in an enclosed suburban shopping mall, which for most of the week houses the Central Martial Arts Academy. Nihilus, along with a business partner who does not do lightsabers, uh, offers classes in Wing Chun, Kali, Jeet Kune Do, a few other things. The mall itself is located in a more affluent suburb of a mid-sized Rust Belt city in the United States. The atmosphere in these other, more traditional classes is markedly different. Social interactions are all inflected by vertical hierarchies that are marked by an explicit system of colored sashes overlaid by the more traditional Chinese system of senior students. What had been a generally relaxed atmosphere is tenser, and that tension shows in the body language and the posture of the students. It reads in a way they automatically form hierarchically graded straight lines, not just at the beginning and ends of class, but like just when they're waiting around for new instructions. That is something you never see at the CLA. We can at best manage a lazy semicircle in no particular order. The rhetoric of these traditional martial arts classes is grimmer. They feature frequent outbursts, like hit him. I mean, really punch him. Remember, that could have been a knife. Anything could have been a knife, right? <laughs> and if you get lazy, this is not going to work on the streets. Students do not come to these classes simply for fun. Their motivations are those that we would generally expect to see of any student in a martial arts school. Some are interested primarily in real-world self-defense skills. Others are looking for a challenging route to self-improvement. And more than a few have been drawn by the school's very well-performing kickboxing team. No matter what goals brought them in, everyone in the Central Martial Arts Academy knows that they are there to be engaged in hard work. And they expect to be held to this high standard. The code switching that Darth Nihilus exhibits when his discussion shifts between these two realms is at times remarkable. When talking about Wing Chun, he is serious, adamant in his views, historically informed, visibly frustrated by the state of lineage politics and quite a few other things with his art, right? He speaks as a martial artist. A tension enters his body language. His jaw clenches. When the conversation turns to lightsaber combat, he relaxes. He adopts a remarkably ecumenical view of the world. He is eager to explore a vast range of activity, from kata or forms practice to competitive tournaments like cosplay and fan films. Anything's good. Here he favors horizontal forms of cooperation in association with other groups with just a very wide range of different interests. It is all, as he frequently reminds us, just for fun. But in strictly empirical terms, this sort of fun is a pretty demanding part-time job for Darth Nihilus. It occupies many hours a week. The CLA is also bringing in a lot of new paying students to his classes who in many cases have never set foot in a martial arts school or a gym before. Right? And in the world of small, often struggling suburban martial arts schools, that is a reality that you simply cannot ignore. In a recent article, I looked at the history basic and basic characteristics of lightsaber combat to argue that while this is a hyper-real practice, meaning that it's based on a fictional text that is universally acknowledged as a fictional text, none of those people thought Jedi were real, okay? 
It nevertheless fulfills all the basic criteria of a martial art. I further suggested that the invention of hyper-real martial arts, if, if we understand it, might help us to grapple with what is going on with the creation of all sorts of martial arts, as well as to begin to wrap our minds around the social functions which they fulfill in a modern society. That, in turn, would tell us something about the motivations that bring students into the martial arts and maybe the future of these sorts of fighting systems. In today's paper, I would like to suggest a possible framework for thinking about um, the varieties of the martial arts in the modern Western world. So let's begin with two very basic questions. First, what sort of martial art is lightsaber combat? And secondly, why would anyone choose to do this, given the vast number of really well-established, historically grounded systems that already exist out there? So to address these puzzles, we're going to begin by looking at a few additional details about life in the Central Lightsaber Academy. And then secondly, we're going to turn to the work of the well-known American anthropologist Victor Turner for some insights into the ways that voluntary associations focused on transformative play might uh, create meaning in, their, in the lives of their members in the modern Western world. So, first off, what is lightsaber combat? Well, at the most basic level, this is a loosely associated collection of combat techniques and performance practices that began to coalesce in the wake of the release of the awful Star Wars prequel movies that came out in like 1999 and 2000, okay? As part of the marketing surrounding those particular films, uh, the, the Lucas Media Empire began to release replica lightsabers that had metal hilts and electronics in the blades that provided sound and lighting effects and then these heavy polycarbonate blades you could smack against things, right? And so those began to hit the market around 2002. But of course, you can't just sell this stuff. You have to advertise it. So at, at the same time in 2002, other elements of Lucas's media empire began to quietly develop an entire invented history for lightsaber training, selling it to a public eager for relics of that far away galaxy. The creators of this new mythology, including an escaped academic, uh, Dr. Reynolds there, who actually wrote the first article outlining this stuff, had a surprisingly free hand because it turns out the original Star Wars films actually said practically nothing about these iconic weapons. So much of this subsequent invented history was organized around Dr. West's uh, idea that the Jedi had had seven forms of classic lightsaber combat that had been developed over a period of thousands and thousands of years. And as he described them, each one of these forms had a unique combat philosophy, some of them quite different from each other. They all had their own specific strengths and weaknesses, which is odd that you'd ever make a martial arts system knowing that it had weaknesses. And uh, the end result is that each one of them basically has the feel of a distinct fencing system. Now, from the start, a clear equation was made between the fictional fighting system of the Jedi Knights and their real world usually Asian counterparts. Each was given a vaguely Eastern sounding name. So form one of the seven forms is known as Sicho. And then they were given a much less Orientalist, or a more Orientalist, more obviously Orientalist animal assumption. So Sicho is the way of the Sarlacc. Popular notions then of what a proper martial art should be came to shape much of what the seven forms became. The first lightsaber group to gain national and international notoriety, if perhaps not the first to actually stage a public performance, is called New York Jedi. They were founded in Manhattan in 2005. They're still active. They still give weekly classes if you're ever in the New York area. They combine instruction in the traditional uh, martial arts with a very heavy emphasis on choreography and stage combat. After their rise to prominence, other groups along the East Coast of the United States and then in other areas around the world began to coalesce and to articulate their own unique vision of what lightsaber combat should be. Some focused on costuming and public performance and usually charity work. Others opted to create something more akin to a very fast-paced, bladed combat sport. 
Uh, more recently, a number of groups have dedicated themselves to combining this mythology of the seven forms of lightsaber combat with historical, uh, real-world fighting skills to try to create a quote-unquote real martial art around the lightsaber. The Central Lightsaber Academy falls into that later category, except a number of members, led by Darth Nihilus himself, actually really enjoy producing the occasional fan film. So this sort of mixing of interests, I think, is much more common in the lightsaber community than you'll see in other areas of the martial arts, where practitioners often draw very strict boundaries based, I think, on competing notions of le legitimacy between practical and performance-based systems. Okay. So we know then that lightsaber combat is a hyper-real martial art. We also know it's a fairly new martial art. It goes without saying that this is a market-driven creation. There would be no lightsaber combat without those movies and the advertising behind them. What else is it? Is lightsaber combat an American martial art? In the current era, many martial arts have come to be seen as indicators of national or regional uh, identity. In some places, the practice of these systems has even become a mechanism for producing a certain sort of citizen, typically one dedicated to the nation, embodying certain identities, and capable of carrying out the state's demands, such as this. In Japan, the Budo arts were re are seen as revealing the essence of you know, the Japanese nation, and they have been closely associated with the state since at least the end of the Meiji period. In China, the Jing Wu Association in the 1920s rose to national prominence by promising to create a new sanitized urban middle class martial art that would not only increase the physical and spiritual strength of the people, but would guarantee national salvation. With some variation and emphasis, that same mission it was carried on by the later Goshu and then Wushu movements. This interest in uncovering the national essence and the cultural heritage of an art can be seen in lots of places, including the popular discussion of Israeli Krav, Krav Maga, Korean Taekwondo, Thai kickboxing, uh, Brazilian capoeira, right? The rise of the martial arts as a tool by which both groups and uh, states have sought to adopt certain identities and then to promote their values on the global stage, I think, is really one of the most striking developments of the 20th century. This strong ethno-nationalist turn has been one of the main means by which the martial arts have done social work in the modern era. First, they labor in the production of mature and strong citizens, and then in the promotion of certain identities both at home and abroad. So what sort of social work does lightsaber combat do? Is this an American martial art projecting American cultural values and identities into a global marketplace? Or is it something else entirely? The Star Wars franchise has already attracted a lot of attention from critical theorists and academic students of cultural studies. Many of them have looked at this project with a fair degree of ambivalence. Some have seen in these films the most conservative and reactionary elements of American society. Uh, one would certainly expect, when you look at a poster like this, that you can make an argument, yeah, this is the exportation, this is the, you know, the globalization of American popular culture at work, right? I suspect that these theorists, if anyone were to ever ask them, would not hesitate to call lightsaber combat, you know, an American martial art. After all, it's hard to think of any film franchise that could be more American. You know, just consider the opening chapter, right, the very first film. You have a, uh, a mashup of a Western with a classic Errol Flynn Hollywood swashbuckler reimagined in the universe of Flash Gordon with a very thin overlay of Kurosawa on it, right? You know, so how could this be anything other, right? Without denying those basic facts, it's nevertheless fascinating to see how resistant the lightsaber community, the global lightsaber community, has been to accepting such labels. Lightsaber combat has been culturally translated and localized with a shocking facility and speed around the world. Some of the first areas to really pick up on this were Southeast Asia and Russia. 
right? Probably the first lightsaber performances were actually done in the Philippines. It's very popular in Southern Europe, in Western Europe, in North America, in South America, in Australia, uh, in practically every place. So how has this been possible? Through a wide variety of books, DVDs, interviews, documentaries, magazine articles, the Star Wars mythos has actively promoted and presented itself to the public as something that is culturally universal. The creators of the franchise, particularly George Lucas, have tried to explain the ongoing appeal of their storylines by pointing to the structuralism of Joseph Campbell and Carl Jung. While these sorts of theories don't sit well with scholars today, they have become a surprisingly important part of how the more uh, thinking Star Wars fan understands their own engagement with the series. They all know who Joseph Campbell is. And this is the touchstone that they often go back to to explain what they like about the series. The end result then has been to partially obscure the national origins and the ideological nature of the story's core value system and replace it with a discourse that's more psychological, more universal in nature. The students of the CLA have also sought to construct lightsaber combats, combat in ways that escape the ethno-nationalist pull that surrounds the other Asian, usually, martial arts. These aren't ideas that they're ignorant of. After all, their class takes place in a training space that, that prominently advertises Chinese Kung Fu and Filipino Kali. Surrounding storefronts in this mall, this mall has an entire wing dedicated to like martial arts studios and physical culture. It is a fascinating research location. Surrounding storefronts offer Taekwondo, Karate, Hungar, Olympic fencing, among other options, right? So anyone coming to a lightsaber class uh, has got to actually physically walk by a number of competing peer alternatives, right? most of which are nationally or regionally identified. So the question is why? Well, some of the more experienced martial artists in the class have drawn explicit connections between the culturally neutral, uh, that's how they see it, uh, aspect uh, of lightsaber fencing, and the possibility of pursuing more creative types of martial play and research than would otherwise be possible. Multiple of them have stated, look, in here I can combine Western, Chinese, Japanese, Filipino, whatever, uh, techniques, and I can test them, and I can see how they work in sparring in a way that would not normally be possible in my kendo class or in a traditional instructional environment. When discussing his engagement with the lightsaber, Darth Nihilus has repeatedly noted the sense of freedom that he enjoys in being able to escape the lineage politics that dominates many of the more traditional Chinese martial arts. This has translated into a greater technical freedom to combine different approaches uh, when that kind of hybridization would be socially monitored and disapproved of in, in his other environment. It also manifests an inability to engage in performance-based activities like fan films and cosplay and you know, hero building. And, and those activities were actually the origin of Nihilus's rather memorable public persona and you know, kind of in-universe name. It would seem that lightsaber combat is not seen as an American martial art, precisely because those who adopt its practice are seeking a specific type of freedom. This manifests itself in a self-conscious turning away from the constraints of the historically grounded, often ethno-nationalist martial arts. Many individuals are drawn to an activity that is like the martial arts on a technical level, but is capable of doing different sort of work in their lives. In lightsaber combat, we see a rejection of constructed nationalist history and a move towards a forward-looking, open-ended system of mythic play. To better understand the details of the social work done within the traditional martial arts, as well as the means by which the hyper-real martial arts seek to escape that, we'll need a set of theoretical tools focused on the different ways that voluntary associations focused on creative play can mediate transformation in the lives of their members. In his writings on the nature of liminality in the modern Western world, Victor Turner provided us with one such framework.
Turner is particularly helpful in the present case as a lot of his research and writing touched on the question of how meaning is generated through both drama and ritual. He expanded on the idea of Van Genep um, to discuss rites of passage or those instances in which someone from one social status, say, you know, a child, an uneducated person, a single person, enters another social status, right? They're married, they're univer uh, university educated, they are an adult. Anthropologists have noted that through rites of passage, such transitions, social transitions, can be made legible and personally meaningful. Following Van Genep, this transition has been described often as a three-part process. A transformative ritual starts when an individual is separated from her community, right? Uh, then there is a liminal period in which the previous identity is stripped away, leaving the initiate in Turner's now famous terms betwixt and between. Lastly, the transformed individual is reincorporated back into a group that is now socially willing to support them in their newly constructed or newly appointed role. Much of Turner's own writing and thinking about ritual focused on that middle or liminal phase. What exactly happens when an individual enters a threshold state but has not yet passed beyond it? How is social meaning created and social knowledge bestowed through ritual and symbolism? Well, according to Turner, this happens in very creative ways. Through a rich combination of rituals, myth, art, rites of reversal, uh, different modes of symbolic teaching, Turner found that individuals can engage in a period of what he called cosmic play, in which they rearrange the basic building blocks of social order, often in ways that to an outsider would look seemingly chaotic or even disordered, right? In so doing, they confront fundamental truths about the nature of the community that were not previously accessible to them, as well as learning something about their own identity and their relationship with society. While Turner's work, like others in his generation, tended to focus on what were then referred to as primitive societies, both he and his students immediately recognized many parallels to these processes in their own much more modern lives. Indeed, there may actually have been too many parallels for comfort. It's not difficult to find striking similarities between rituals and initiatory processes described in the classic ethnographic literature and a lot of similar practices in modern Western society. You know, consider joining a fraternity on a university campus or a religious baptism in a neighborhood church or joining a social order like the Rotary Club or something like that. A lot of them exhibit something very much like this three-part structure of separation, liminality, and reintegration. Nor would we be the first to note that martial arts training is full of ritual both big and small. They can be seen in the wearing of special clothing, such as you know, the white karate gi that is often said to represent burial clothes. The grueling public ordeals endured in some rank tests that I'm sure we've all been through. The more grueling public tournaments, which I'm also sure some of us have been through. All of these are explicitly designed to perform two social functions. First, to elevate an individual status in the community from novice to full member or to expert. And second, to create a sense of social meaning and fulfillment by passing on a specific set of physical practices or cultural philosophies, which we are forever reminded have their truest applications beyond the confines of the training hall. Is it surprising, then, that in the current era, Western consumers have come to see the Asian martial arts as vehicles of personal transformation par excellence? If you want to be a different person, this is what you do. You join a martial arts class. In an increasingly secular society, they appear to be taking on essential social and psychological roles that might previously have been fulfilled by other sorts of community ritual. Nor are individuals the only ones who have taken note of the transformative power and liminal potential of the martial arts. States such as Japan, China, and Korea, to name three of the more obvious examples, um, determined during the 20th century that martial arts practices could be adopted not just to improve civilian public health and fitness, but to create institutions through which individuals could be inducted into a new, specifically curated vision 
of the state and society and the relationship between those two things. Martial arts reformers, eager for government patronage, designed specific programs and lobbied them, like in the case of Japan, for decades to actually have them included in school curriculums to do just that. The emergence of a close association between the Asian martial arts and ethno-nationalism was neither a coincidence nor a reflection of the essential nature of these practices. Both martial arts modernizers and government reformers worked hard to make those connections happen and then to promote all of this on the international stage. So on the one hand, we have individuals adopting these practices as a means of personal improvement or even just recreation. And then on the other hand, we have these powerful social forces attempting to co-opt them as modern rites of passage, ones that can do the social work of creating certain kinds of citizens and favored identities. Of course, it's not necessary that those two goals should or must contradict each other, but sometimes they're going to. So to grasp what that implies for our theoretical understanding of lightsaber combat, we need to return to one of Victor Turner's um, fundamental questions that he asked throughout his career uh, about the nature of ritual. What exactly is transformed in a rite of passage? Is it the initiate who is undergoing this ritual? Or should we instead be focusing our attention on the community as a whole? Turner argued that in a classic rite of passage, the intended subject of transformation is always the community. That's actually what's at stake. Well, yeah, the individual is affected by this. The fundamental question is how is the group going to process? Will the group accept their change in social status? And so he noted that his own students, uh, he's speaking of his undergraduate students, uh, were fundamentally mistaken when they looked at, let's say, their fraternity initiations and they said, aha, I have undergone a rite of passage, right? He cautioned in his 1974 essays that true examples of rites of passage can only be found in small-scale societies uh, characterized by primary face-to-face -face interactions. So we're talking about, you know, tribal communities, isolated religious colonies, things of that nature. Now, Given the obvious structural similarities where we, we still have this three-part initiatory process, what exactly separates these two scenarios, right, between that small-scale world and the much bigger uh, industrial world? The fact that these rights were often compulsory, like, you know, militia duty, if you were back in China, uh, is a characteristic of, of the small-scale society that, that the Turner says we really need to be paying attention to, right? These rituals were events through which society understood itself, even ones that looked like a lot of fun, you know, seemingly riotous rites of reversals and bacchanalia, like, you know, seasonal festivals, for Turner were examples of social work because they demanded the participation of the entire community. You, you couldn't really opt out. All of these activities were socially mandated and were therefore a type of labor, no, much, no matter how much fun you might be having in your militia training, right? So none of them fell into the category of leisure, as we would use the term in the modern Western world today. Turner argued that that didn't really occur until we got the commodification of labor and capital during what Karl Polanyi referred to as the Great Transformation. An individual who joins a modern church, a modern fraternity, a modern martial arts society, like that guy on the bottom there, is in a very different position than his ancient forebearers. These are activities that in the modern world explicitly occupy our leisure, right? They cannot be compelled. Individuals participate in these activities or these rites because they themselves feel drawn to them. So that takes what was once a form of social work and it makes it much more personal, much more psychological in nature. Nor are all of these sorts of experiences exactly the same. 
In his article, Turner went on to conclude that there were at least two distinct types of institutions that seemed to, uh, to structure these modern voluntary activities. The first category, he somewhat confusingly still referred to as liminal, as they most closely resembled those rituals from a previous era that in many cases they may have emerged out of. So these included things like, again, baptisms, uh, seasonal celebrations, traditional religious weddings. Yet while they resemble the or older rites of passage, they are still voluntary in nature. Simply put, nobody can force you to join the Rotary Club, right? That, that remains voluntary, right? As such, he noted, well, I, you hope, that his continued use of the term liminal has got to be understood metaphorically in this particular instance. Turner then identified another group of activities which were even less socially focused in nature. They were more oriented towards individual play, experimentation, and self-expression. These could still induce a process of personally meaningful transformation in the individual, but they were less likely to encourage that individual to conform their life to some socially hegemonic pattern, right? At times, they could even take on anti-systemic characteristics. Turner termed this second group of practices the liminoid, right? Now, by Turner's own admission, his exploration of these two categories was experimental in nature, and I gotta agree with that. That 1974 article reads like a rough draft. As a first cut, he found that liminal practices tended to be community-oriented. They emerge out of larger social patterns. They're comprised of symbols that are universally recognized. You all know what a Christmas tree is, whether or not you ever put one up. They're fundamentally eufunctional, meaning that they reinforce widely held social, economic, and political identities. Uh, a baptism, you know, would be a great example of something, you know, that falls into that ca category. In contrast, Liminoid activities tended to arise later in history. They're more focused on individual attainment. Uh, they're often distributed via economic markets. Uh, they develop at the margin of society. They are, by their very nature, fragmentary and experimental. They tend to break into schools. Uh, liminoid activities can rearrange symbols in highly idiosyncratic, even monstrous ways. They have the potential to critique dominant social discourses. Uh, common examples would, create, would involve the creation of you know, out, outsider art, you know, fan fiction, lots of different sorts of sports and games, or I don't know, let's say lightsaber combat, okay? So these categories, I think, can begin to help us make sense of what is going on with Darth Nihilus's, you know, seemingly schizophrenic personality, right? They may also suggest something about the varieties of social work that the martial arts are being called on to perform in the global system today. Lastly, a closer look at how these ideas function in the realm of the martial arts might suggest some ways to actually improve Turner's conceptualization of these two ideas. Now, it's not difficult to discern a liminal aspect within the Chinese martial arts. While students of martial arts studies classify wushu as a voluntary activity, one suspects that many of the young children that fill the wushu academies of Shandong and Henan province were not fully consenting participants in the decision-making process that sent them to these often grueling, inhumane boarding schools. Uh, instead, their guardians made the decision that it was a better environment for their children as it would give them the cultural and technical skills that they needed to become a certain sort of adult, specifically one that could get a job, right? Hopefully with the police or the military. The martial arts have come to be an, aspect, an accepted aspect of childhood education in the West as well. Well, what do we hope our children gain from these exercises? To listen to the rhetoric and the advertising surrounding them, self-confidence and compliance seem to be the two things that we are most interested in. Now, regardless of what actual goals are accomplished in our classes, uh, these are framed as means of creating a certain sort of adult. Again, ones that will succeed within society's dominant cultural and economic paradigms. Now, many of these same liminal characteristics can be noted in 
uh, martial arts classes aimed at adults as well. As John Nielsen and I reported in our book, The Creation of Wing Chun, A Social History of the Southern Chinese Martial Arts, Ip Man's notable martial arts abilities were not the only thing, or maybe even the major thing, that attracted teenage and young adult students to him in the early 1950s. After all, in the aftermath of the 1949 liberation of the mainland, Hong Kong was quite literally overrun with talented martial artists. So what sets Ip Man apart? Well, he'd been a member of the new gentry back in Guangdong. As such, he had received this dual Confucian and Western education. He had a deep cultural knowledge of a past that young adults in the Crown Colony felt cut off from. He was an individual who had synthesized the lessons of two worlds and could model the virtue of an unapologetically Chinese identity in a globally connected modern metropolis. Many of his younger students, by their own admission, uh, were drawn to him because they idolized the Confucian glamour that he projected. Contemporary government-sponsored wushu in mainland China today, and, and the sorts of uh, things that existed in the Wing Chun community of Hong Kong and Macau in the 1950s and 60s, are very different types of social institutions. They kind of define polar ends of the spectrum of what is possible within the Chinese martial arts. Yet both of them are engaged in the social work of producing certain sorts of citizens. Uh, in the first case, this takes a very statist cast, right? Well, it, man's project is more local and social in nature. Yet in both instances, we see martial arts training attempting to produce a type of student that is accepting of important social values, uh, and this happens through a process of physical transformation. This is one of the reasons why I think that the creation myths of the various Chinese martial arts are so important. It would be a real mistake to just dismiss them as bad history. Instead, they function as a lens by which this community views itself, right? Uh, they, they are the way in which you find yourself in your place in the social landscape. Yim Wing Chung, Wang Fei Hung, the many, many monks of the Shaolin Temple are important because they literally point the way. They illustrate the destination that initiate has set out to achieve. A traditional martial arts class then Asian martial arts class, Chinese martial arts class, is characterized by a type of liminal play. We set aside our mundane professional identity when we enter the training space. We submit ourselves to a new social hierarchy. We, re we reverse and rearrange the most basic cultural values that we brought with us as we suddenly find ourselves punching, throwing, choking our fellow initiates. Yet all of this happens within limits, and it's subordinated to a single transformative vision. All of this conforms, more or less, to Turner's expectations for a more traditional liminal experience in the modern world. Creative play is possible, but only up to a point, and only in the service of certain social goals. Now, I've spent a number of years directly observing Wing Chun classes, and I listen to what people say, and in lots of classes you hear people talking in gushing terms about Ning Moi and Yim Wing Chun, these kind of founding mythological figures. In other classes, you might hear people doubting that they exist, but you know what I have never heard? I have never heard anyone root for the bad guys of that creation myth. I have never heard anyone say, you know who I want to be like? I want to be like those Manchu banner men because they burned the Shaolin Temple to the ground. They killed most of the monks. They won, right? They're the tough guys. Why wouldn't you want to be like them to have that martial prowess? Well, that's the sort of thing that happens multiple times a day at the Central <laughs> Lightsaber Academy, right? At first glance, one might think that the big difference between that and the Wing Chun class that happens right before it is the unreality of its chosen weapons. And it's easy to become fixated on the glowing, buzzing blade. That's why they made it glowing and buzzing. <laughs> Much more important, though, is the open-ended and freewheeling way in which symbols can be manipulated, reversed, and hybridized in one environment, but not in the other. 
We've already noted that such extended play exists on a technical level, yet the creative ability to rearrange symbols goes far beyond just the question of fencing. Consider the, the fact that the CLA is run by a figure who has adopted the title Darth Nihilus, which means the Dark Lord of Hunger. That is his personal persona for interacting with the public lightsaber community, right? Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Star Wars mythos, I first of all apologize for this entire talk. <laughs> and secondly, I, know, I should note that the title Darth is not worn by the heroes of that story. Anyone with the word Darth in front of their name is a bad guy. These are the masters of a malignant political and metaphysical philosophy that is said to have been responsible for literally billions and billions of deaths in their age-old war against the Jedi. The specific storyline behind the various Darths are interesting to consider, though they would take us really too far afield. At the most basic level, many of these Dark Lords have, through a process of corruption, become less than fully human. In many cases, their lack of emotional empathy is mirrored by physical damage or decay. They, they do not or cannot draw on the healing and life-sustaining aspects of the Force. Many of them have become monstrous machine-human hybrids. Sith characters are always sociopathic, usually psychotic. Uh, that makes them very interesting foils for storytelling. And when not teaching either Wing Chun or lightsaber combat, Darth Nihilus spends a lot of uh, resources on hero building, in his case, uh, maybe villain construction, right? This includes crafting an elaborate backstory, designing cosplay costumes, producing a really elaborate fan film in which his alter ego kills vast, vast numbers of Jedi most of whom are played by his students, and then enough innocent bystanders so that you know that it's not just business, that you know, his heart is really in it, all right? Now, not all of the students of the CLA follow this same left-handed path, right? Others have invested considerable time and resources in the construction of more traditionally heroic Jedi persona. Then there's a third group who are turned off by the psychotic nature of the Jedi, uh, sorry, psychotic nature of the Sith and the overly structured lives of the Jedi. It turns out no one is actually in favor of celibacy anymore. So we have a lot of people inventing gray Jedi characters where they kind of mix and match elements from these two competing mythologies to create something that, that kind of reflects uh, their own personality. Occasionally you'll even see characters brought in from outside the Star Wars universe. So that is more controversial. Uh, but that was something that was pioneered by New York Jedi right back at the very beginning of this trend. But well over half of the students at the CLA ignore these exercises altogether. They instead focus on other things. It might be Star Wars trivia or collecting lightsabers. Other students see themselves primarily as martial artists. They come to class wearing Kali t-shirts or Wing Chun t-shirts. And that last contingent reminds us of an important and paradoxical fact. Not every member of the CLA identifies themselves as a Star Wars fan. Not everyone even likes Star Wars. Everyone's pretty much seen the movies. But beyond that, a lot of people haven't had any interest in exploring anything else in this universe. While some students may understand lightsaber combat as an aspect of their fandom, a lot of other participants see this primarily as a way to stay in shape with a supportive community of like-minded friends. While everyone views their practice, everyone I have interviewed, everyone views their practice as personally important and deeply transformative, the goals that they are seeking are strikingly personal in nature. There is no single symbolic pathway that all lightsaber students seek to follow. Lightsaber combat then presents us with a powerful example of Turner's concept of the liminoid. In comparison, the Wing Chun classes at the Central, Mar uh, Central Martial Arts Academy are vertically structured, designed to advance a very specific skill set. Its curriculum is meant to have a transformative impact on students, one that will see them replicate a U-functional set of behaviors outside of the school. That is literally Turner's definition of the liminal. In contrast, the Central Lightsaber Academy exists only to cooperatively fill individual desires for highly creative, sometimes idiosyncratic, and even monstrous play. 
Students are free to focus on sparring and practical lightsaber combat, or they can skip that, and they can do traditional forms training, or they can skip that, and they can focus on choreography and fan films. They can engage in cosplay and hero building. They can try on villainous or heroic alter egos. The, individual in the, the individuals in this community, I should point out, are not socioeconomically marginal compared to similarly situated martial arts groups in my research area, yet they are actively choosing to play at these social margins. This cacophony of goals and purposes coexists both within my research location and within the lightsaber community as a whole. I think, however, that we should be cautious about reifying these two categories, the liminal and the liminoid, as binary opposites. Certain students of the anthropology of athletics have noted that Turner's categories here sometimes have trouble categorizing individual activities. So Sharon Rowe, one of these anthropologists who, who looks at basketball, noted that, you know, while a basketball league at your local YMCA pretty much fits Turner's definition of a liminoid like he'd expect, when you get to the NBA, when you get to pro ball, things become much, much more complicated. When you look at the social discourses surrounding the NBA, its fan base, how it involves entire cities, it begins to look a lot more liminal. And she's gone so far as to argue that, you know what, sports and games should never be classified as uh, liminoid. They should only be classified as liminal because that's how they exist in their uh, professional incarnation. I think that our current case instead suggests that the liminal and the liminoid should be seen as existing on a continuum, uh, which kind of follows the work of Andrew Spiegel as well. Well, Darth Nihilus's Wing Chun class appears to be liminal compared to his lightsaber class, compared to that, uh, you know, Wushu school uh, in China. Uh, that is literally producing tens of thousands of students, indoctrinating tens of thousands of students for, for service in a state security apparatus? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, only a little bit. We, we need to consider degrees of kind, or uh, matters of de degree as well as matters of kind when evaluating these martial arts institutions. Still, Turner's basic distinction between the liminal and the liminoid is helpful to students of martial arts studies precisely because it suggests that totalizing statements about the role of these combat systems in modern society are always bound to miss the mark. Rather than being one thing, Turner suggests that there are different types of social work that we can expect to see in the modern martial arts. Oops, yeah, sorry, skipped one. The success of hyperreal uh, arts, divorced from the myths of nationalism and focused on enjoyment rather than hard work, uh, of the hard work of producing ever more ideal citizens, should force us to think about the future of the martial arts in our current era. Lightsaber combat demonstrates a world in which the plural, the fragmentary, the experimental can exist and succeed despite the existence of the universal the disciplined, and the hierarchically organized. It may be that Darth Nihilus' frequent refrain that this is all just for fun is as much a warning to us as students of martial arts studies as it is a reassurance to his own apprentices. Accepting his statement might signal the disruption of our understanding of what the martial arts can be, what the basic motivations drawing people in sometimes are. What else, but what else would we expect from a dark lord of the Sith? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, now I know that I can type for Yes, you can. Yes. That's <laughs> um, really not a question. So there's this concept that for normal civilized, socialized people to <coughs> fight, they have to other, mm -hmm. they have to, they have to um, dehumanize. Yeah. It, they have to, they, it's also just called psych yourself up. Right. You know, some, some sort of um, and reflecting on this historically, the Chinese milieu, yeah. it often was kind of the reverse. You made yourself into a god yeah. or a superhero yeah. or a dark lord. Yeah. 
Um, and I'm, I'm just kind of wondering if you reflected on that, that, that kind of freedom probably was initially there. And I guess the only other thing I would say is being in a real martial arts school mm -hmm. um, is stressful. Yeah. Because you're being at your identity is being challenged. You're, in other words, mm -hmm. you're supposed to stay you, yeah. but you're supposed to do something you would never do. Yeah. Uh, yes, I have been thinking about this quite a bit for about six months now, um, you know, kind of every day. And I, I've talked to a lot of people about this. Uh, I, I think that it's still the case, though, that there's something fundamentally different in that, yeah, sure, you know, lots of boxers in the Boxer Rebellion invoke Pigsy, right? But there are lots of people that they don't invoke, right? You know, th there was a can, you know, there, there's a, a canon of deity that, that is available to you and it's socially accepted and is doing social work, like you know, to invoke those gods and then to, you know, banish, you know, those demons. Whereas here, the, the entire point of this is that you get to be socially dysfunctional. You know, so, yeah, you're right. I, I think that they, they took all of that out of the modern Chinese martial arts. You know, even if you go back to the 1920s, there are quite a few people who remember that. I can find newspaper articles about it. But man, the scope of play that I see in the lightsaber classes, it's greater even than anything I read about, you know, in the Qing Dynasty. Anything else? Maybe next year. <laughs> That, that, that is, that's the case, but in America, we don't have any governing bodies for anything, period. I mean, the martial, the martial arts proper are much more chaotically organized in the U.S. than they are in Europe. I mean, they're not organized in the U.S. So in that sense, it's not really different. Um, I, I would say, because I thought about this too, I would say that the difference is actually in the types of institutions rather than the the, the, the size of them. There are some very large, very sophisticated lightsaber groups out there, right? You know, one, the one that I'm associated with is called the Terra Prime Lightsaber Academy, and they have thousands and thousands of members, and they have a complex social structure. Um, the big one in Europe right now is called Ludo Sport, which is run out of Italy, and they're just ferociously organized and very good at making money and, and very popular. And, you know, they're advertising their Olympic aspirations on their web page, right? <laughs> so, no, there, there is a, you know, they're, they're trying, and, and they're trying to get people to coalesce under their banner. So we're talking about a set of practices that's only 10 years old, right? So there are limits to how formalized we can get. There are institutions, but uh, it seems to be kind of what the institutions want, you know, what they're interested in. You know, you look at some of these groups and you realize, no, no, they are really h highly promoting cosplay and charity work. That's, that's really what they want to see, you know. I want to thank you. That was mm -hmm. fascinating. I just wanted to ask about the technical level in terms of the technique that's being mm -hmm. used. Um, how much does the lightsaber uh, open up a space of totally free play where it's just kind of what kinds of fencing technique do we want to and to what extent, maybe it's different from different institutions, but mm -hmm. and to what extent is there some uh, imagined physics of the lightsaber as a weapon which then requires some interesting kind of like research in what, in, in what kind of technique would be possible if the weapon exists? Uh, there's both. There, there's quite a bit of both. I mean, the first response, there's, there's actually a specific reason why I didn't bring uh, lightsabers, which is that I thought Paul wouldn't appreciate it because when you pick these things up, you're like, oh my god, this is a weapon. It has heft to it. It feels like a sword. It has a blade. And I know it's not real, so immediately I'm going to hit him in the head <laughs> just to see what this does. I mean, it is amazing. I mean, literally, you put this in someone's hand, and the very first thing they do is try to smack their buddy with it, which is a terrible idea because those polycarbonate blades are heavy and rigid, and they can knock teeth out <laughs> and stuff like that. And, and they do, ergo, the heavy fencing masks. 
and stuff that, that you see there. So what happened is, you know, martial artists uh, pick these blades up and they're like, this is a fantastic training tool. And it's really simple, which means it's really universal. So I can do my Kali Heaven Six with a couple of them, or I can do Kendo, or I can do Wushu, and I can suddenly start combining those things in, the ways, in ways that I couldn't do with like a wooden Wushu broadsword or something like that. And, and so the nature of that weapon and I'm very interested in the physicality of this and the materiality of it. The nature of that weapon really lent itself to this sort of hybridization. On the other hand, yeah, there is imagined physics here. This is an all-cutting plasma blade. You don't have to have a lot of force to, to really mess someone up with a lightsaber. So like a small upward flick to your opponent's hands that wouldn't probably count as a strike in most traditional martial arts system. You'd be hitting with the back of the sword. There's no force behind it. Yeah, well, that's going to take a hand off with a lightsaber, right? And, and so, yeah, that does begin to force you to think differently about your technique. Mm -hmm. in this idea of liminal and liminoid as continuum. Um, well, he, the first thing that stands out yeah. to me is that, you know, be, because of the era that Turner yeah. grew up in as a scholar, he, he thinks in terms of boxes yeah. maybe a little too much. Yeah. So, so the, and, and he, he's not, the, the people he was working with are not the ones putting themselves in that, those boxes. Mm -hmm. He's putting them in those boxes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Whereas you're taking an ethnographic approach where you're, you're asking people what boxes they see themselves. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. that's, a really, that's a really important difference. Um, I, I think though maybe, maybe it, can be, it can even go further mm -hmm. and, and I wonder uh, as you continue mm -hmm. to do this work, mm -hmm. um, how comfortable you are mm -hmm. with this you know, mm -hmm. liminal liminoid mm -hmm. uh, dichotomy, or is it, is it a dichotomy? I, I really think it's a continuum myself. And the funny thing is, I think Turner, I, like I said, I think this was a rough draft. I, I'm kind of interested in, in how it got published. I have just poured over that article. I've read it a dozen times. And I think Turner was confused himself as to whether these were boxes or a spectrum because he presents them as discrete categories. But then when he's describing them, he has this entire section where he talks about the roots of the liminoid can, he says this exactly, the roots of the liminoid are always found within the liminal, right? So he's advising his graduate students, look, if you're interested in figuring out where the liminoid comes from, go to a primitive society, look at a rite of initiation, and then look and see if there's a contest for who is the best athlete in the rite or who is the best artist, where there's personal acknowledgement. And what you'll find is that the roots of the liminoid are always in the liminal. So that was where I got the idea that there, these should be a spectrum was actually from a very close reading of Turner because it seemed to me that he was even fundamentally right. unclear right. in his definition. And then, you know, the other side of the fraternity example mm -hmm. that, that he uses it, yeah. is actually a good example of that validity yeah. and, and where he's essentially wrong mm -hmm. in saying that that's not, that that, that's not the analogy. Yeah. Because the people who are, you know, at least where I come from, yeah. but which is a very poor mm -hmm. part of the United States, mm -hmm. uh, the people who join fraternities mm -hmm. are doing so because they operate under certain social and economic constraints yeah. that that channel them into yeah. those those social structures. They, yeah. they feel compelled to do that. Yeah, and again, I mean, I think you see that confusion with him saying, okay, we have the liminal, but then in the modern world, the liminal can't exist, but man, this is so much like the liminal, I'm going to call it liminal anyway, <laughs> even though you all know it's a metaphor, right? So yeah, I, 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 this is an area where I think martial arts studies could make an important conceptual contribution, right, to the development of these ideas in the sports literature and other areas like that. Mm -hmm. And I think in the, in the reading, yeah, mm -hmm. sometimes it can seem that these are, are more absolute. Mm 
mm -hmm. kind of uh, separations. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think he was continuously teasing out mm -hmm. the entailments of, the, of those as markers yeah. of certain kind. Then I think yeah. w what you were talking about that was, was spot on in relation to that. So, uh, Great. Uh, so just one, one little <coughs> uh, general comment uh, about this is kind of goes sideways mm -hmm. to your um, when you were talking about uh, the ethno national, mm -hmm. um, and because this is this is often the case with with East Asian mm -hmm. uh, and some and Southeast Asian martial arts, and mm -hmm. I think it's fascinating in India mm -hmm. that because it's a it's a, it's a multiple linguistic and there's no single you know mm -hmm. even though there are multiple martial arts mm -hmm. there are always very multiple martial arts mm -hmm. but there's much more. Mm -hmm. Dispersion and fragmentation, and that function is served in India by yoga now, especially with with, with Modi and yeah. Hindu nationalism, and Joe Walter's work mm -hmm. in that direction. Yeah, he, and his discussion of, of the yogic body that lies behind again the, the paradigms in India. And I just wanted to mention that. So, for mm -hmm. those of you who think about those kinds of questions, mm -hmm. India is this kind of strange anomaly. But yoga is serving that function. Yeah. And so, uh, uh, which I think is a very important part of, yeah. of those discussions yeah. in relation to the kind of what's marking mm -hmm. the ethno national and how, the, how are those discourses and practices yeah. used and really in, in certain contexts. Oh, that's so very interesting. As a contrast to yeah, well, it, it opens up some avenues for hypothesis testing right there. Yeah. 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 Okay, I'm going to try to keep this on time. So, um, Thank you.